Well, let's switch topics for a minute. If it makes sense to use material already in space for projects in space, it should occur to us all in a minute or two thinking about it that the moon's not the only place that's in space. There's lots of things in space. And one of the best classes of objects to consider for future space projects on materials are the asteroids. Now, asteroids don't only exist in the belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. In fact, many come very close to the Earth, both in terms of delta V, change in velocity, and physical proximity, physical position. In fact, two asteroids in the last couple of years have come closer to the Earth than the Earth's own moon, prompting Congress to tell NASA, you will do two studies, which you both just finished up. The first one is, tell us how we can, for a moderate amount of money, find the asteroids that are passing through our neighborhood so it doesn't come as a rude surprise one day. <laughs> and two, tell us what we should do if we find one that's going to be dropping in for dinner. What do we do about it? And those are just two. This is a painting by the famous space artist Chesley Bonstall. He painted this one of the last things he did. He died at the age of 100 several years ago. He painted this when he was 98 or 99 years old. It's a multinational mission to the asteroids. You can see the flags that they have good eyes around it equator of the spacecraft. Bonisto was a funny guy, and he would tell you if you, if you didn't see your flag, he would say, oh yeah, your flag is just right there. <laughs> the asteroids not only come in many different locations, some of which are extremely convenient to us, but they also come in about three major flavors. Stony asteroids, not particularly appetizing, they're rocks. Iron nickel asteroids, which would be considered extremely high grade iron ore. In fact, we have mined them. A little aside, it's now widely believed by anthropologists that the first iron that was ever worked on the Earth was probably meteors. You know, because they're on the ground, people pick them up there. They feel funny. If you've ever handled a meteor, it's about 10 times heavier than the average rock, five times heavier anyway. And they probably played with them and discovered that if you heat them up, you could make them more ductile. So people have probably been working asteroidal materials before they worked Earth materials. And most people don't know this, but at the time of the founding of America, for example, most learned people did not believe that meteors came from the sky. In fact, Thomas Jefferson once said the equivalent, this is not a quote, but he said, just simply believe in Santa Claus has believed that these things fall from the sky. So anyway, working meteoric metal is not such a rad, rad, radical idea. In fact, in, the nor in North America, the biggest source of nickel is an asteroid impact in Sudbury, Ontario, called the Sudbury Astrolime. Space star blanish is what it means. So we've been doing this. This ain't new stuff, gang. Mining asteroids, old hat. Okay? The third flavor of asteroids, the most interesting flavor, is the juiciest one. Carbonaceous chondrites. Water. Nitrogen. Stuff you haven't found on the moon yet in, in quantity. So they're very interesting, and a number of people are, are thinking that uh, Maybe the uh, grizzled old prospector and his burrow will be replaced by the grizzled old prospector and her space pod. <laughs> his space pod in this case. And what you might do, in fact, is you may alter the orbits of some pieces of asteroids or entire asteroids to put them where you'd like them to be. An old cartoon had somebody standing on, on some part of the Earth with a big sign that said, iron mine to be erected on this site. But <laughs> I wouldn't want to write the environmental impact statement for that. But what you might do is actually move a, a chunk of material to say high Earth orbit. And this shows that exact thing happening. And the way it's happening is our old friend, the mass driver, is being used not as a catapult for throwing things off a heavy body into space, but as a sort of electric engine. Instead of throwing ionized atoms backwards, by electrostatic means, it's throwing big chunks, or, or it's throwing powder or gas, probably, electrically, but high thrust, using electricity from solar cells. And in fact, we just looked at this in the NASA workshop on what to do about asteroids that are going to drop in on us. And it may even be that there are asteroids, sort of a wild card type of a space resource. We're not sure if it exists, but there may be some trap in the Earth's own orbit. Pretend for a minute the green dot on this slide where it says Earth is Jupiter. In the 1700s, a French-Italian 
mathematician and scientist named Lagrange predicted mathematically that the interaction of the gravity of the Sun and Jupiter would create catch pockets, regions, catch pockets for asteroids. In 1908, a German astronomer named Max Wolf found one of those asteroids, and he named it Achilles. And astronomers, being hopelessly romantic, named all the asteroids that they found, and they found them in both spots, as predicted by Lagrange. They named, they named them either after Greeks or Trojan heroes from the Trojan War. All the Greeks in one bunch, all the Trojans in another bunch. Except they mixed some up, and those are known colloquially as the spies. The reason I'm telling you this trivia is not for cocktail party use. Don't try this at home. The reason is, so you'll always remember that when you have a three-body lineup like this, those are called Trojan locations. And in 1978 or so, Professor Hannes Alfing, Nobel Prize winning physicist, got together with us at SSI and said, hey guys and gals, how about if you think about the possibility of the Earth and the Sun capturing Trojans. Maybe there are some Earth-Sun Trojan asteroids. Interesting idea. It's generated a couple of PhD theses at Princeton. The bottom line is that it is possible that the Earth and the Sun trap asteroids. They look like they'd be stable for many millions of years. Uh, there are some possible problems from gravity effects of nearby planets. But it turns out that about a year ago, a Mars-Sun Trojan was discovered. And if a wimpy little planet like Mars can trap Trojans, it's probable that the Earth has some as well. They're tough to find because you have to look in the general direction of the sun. This is not the scale. You have to look at the horizon for these things. But there's some work going on now to try to detect Trojans. And why do we care? The reason we care is that these locations, we can pretend that this whole slide is painted on a, on a record, on a long plane record with a hole in the center of the sun. Those asteroids move in lockstep with the Earth as it moves around the Sun. So those asteroids are always they're flying information with us. And that's not something most asteroids do. In fact, an aster asteroids have one bad property. It's called long synodic period. What that means is that they don't line up very well, very frequently. If you miss the bus, the next bus comes in 15 years. Mm, bummer. But these <laughs> asteroids are always in the same spot with respect to us. And there's another nice property stems from that, and that is you can trade off time of flight against delta V, against change of velocity. So you can, if you're willing to accept the long travel time to send things back to Earth, you can have very low amounts of energy required, the lowest, these are the easiest things to visit in the solar system. Well, suppose I were to tell you that, that uh, space scientists have detected a class of objects which come almost into Earth orbit. They were about 75% high-grade metal and about 25% water by weight. I hope you would say, let's tell me more. Let's go get them. I'm going to show you a picture of them. Here's what these asteroids are. They're man-made asteroids. Space shuttle external tanks. Every time we fly a space shuttle, we accelerate this huge tank that weighs about 66,000 pounds. When it's empty, and it's never empty when we let go of it, we accelerate it to 99% of orbital velocity. We purposely shut off the shuttle's engines, which robs it of some performance, so that this tank will not go into space. And the reason for that is the tank is so light and has such a big cross-section that it's coming down in a month or two unless you shepherd it. So unless you have an active plan to take care of these things, they're coming down and you can't predict where. By dumping it on purpose, Yes, it robs the shuttle of some performance, but you know it's coming down between the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean, between here and Hawaii, and closer to Hawaii. But if you think about these things as a space resource instead of a liability, they are perfect. Low delta V, we've already paid the price to get it in orbit. Known composition, you don't have to send a space probe there. You don't have to do gamma ray spectroscopy. You know what it's made of. And what it's made of is goodies, aluminum, oxygen and hydrogen, and, and some lots of wires and cables and pipes of various things. Very little process. It's pre-processed for you. So we've been looking at how you could mine this kind of space resource. And I'd like to show you quickly some, 
some slides which depict work which we just completed with the Air Force at the Air Force Institute of Technology at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. As I said, I directed the project with funding from Martin Marietta, which built the tank, which also gave us a lot of in kind support in the form of information. The mission we gave this group of Air Force uh, researchers was to look at how you could take a tank apart in space so that you could use the raw materials for things like demonstration solar power platforms. Uh -oh. Pardon me, I have to do some surgery here. And what they, and the, the pictures I'm attempting to show you were produced <laughs> by Produced by a Space Studies Institute artist named Ron Jones, who uses a, a unique photo montage technique. I was with him when he showed these to NASA. And the NASA guy said, I don't remember us taking pictures from the space shuttle. He <laughs> got a standing ovation when he was done. He's a senior associate of our institute, as are some of the people who are in the room today. In fact, this work piggybacked on some NASA work. NASA had an interesting. Uh, study some years ago, a Harvard astrophysicist said, we could build a telescope that could image gamma ray sources if we could figure a way to trap a very big bubble of gas. And the idea was you could use the external tank as a, to hold a big bubble of gas. So NASA Marshall Space Flight Center down in Huntsville worked on this project, and, and they came up with a terrific acronym, especially well suited to Huntsville which was Gamma Ray Imaging Telescope System, GRITS. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a GRITS device that our students use. It's a combination uh, station keeping package. It's got propellant on board to keep the tank from falling back to the earth. And it also has some, uh, some deployable solar arrays. It's been attached to the fittings which exist on the tank for the solid rocket boosters. And the deployable arrays came out. Uh, <laughs> using uh, techniques well known to people in this room. This is actually a slide that was produced in the GRITS program. NASA took external tank sections, put them in the neutral buoyancy chamber. They hate it when you call it a swimming pool. <laughs> it's not a swimming pool. This is the real size of these things. There is a manhole at the aft end of the hydrogen tank, the back end of the shuttle tank. And the astronauts worked in uh, actual astronauts and other workers went into this tank and tried doing what these folks are doing. They removed the insulation, the Sophie. They unbolted the manhole and they went inside. And this is really what it would look like if you were inside this tank and you set up a light source in there. And I'm showing this mainly to show you the size of these tanks. If you ever have a chance, you must go and see a shuttle external tank. They are huge. And we throw them away. Our students were working on the idea of scavenging the materials from the hydrogen portion of the tank, which is the big cylindrical section. They looked at doing it in two different ways. One way involved a robotic arm, which had an electron beam cutter at the end and a claw to pick the pieces that were cut off and stack them. And the other way that they looked, they actually looked at three ways, but there were variants in the first two. And the, the second one was they had astronauts working the E-beam cutter. We call that the Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, EBA style. And it turns out that they're both pretty efficient. What we liked was the robotic cutter, the astronauts set up the tools, and then they go sit in the shuttle and watch the robot do its thing, because it does it pretty quickly. And if, it, if something breaks or needs kick in the slats, they can come out and kick it. But they can stay away from it if they wish as well. And part by part, sections of the tank are removed, actually in small strips. There are stringers inside the tank attached to the skin of the tank, and if you cut them in these strips, you get nice little eye beams. When you're finished, you have what the students appropriately call the bird cage. But you've also got all the tools that you've installed. So what you do is you bring your next tank to the same location, attach it, and move some of the tools, move the, the cutting tools and the manipulation tools, you leave the power thing where it was, into the next tank. And you can do this for a number of tanks. 
And it looks like it's cost effective at about three tanks on that versus earth launching of these materials. Now we have concentrated at SSI, Space Studies Institute, at eating the tanks, using them as raw materials. Others, I should tell you, and most of you probably know, have looked at using the tanks as habitable volume. Uh, the External Tanks Corporation in Boulder, Colorado. And another idea is to use the tank as a big piece of real estate to put things on the outside, sort of a space industrial park. Uh, there's a company called Global Outpost, which is founded by one of the founders of the Spacehead Company. Which is looking at that. So that's a good thing to do, too. Another kind of resource, which is also sort of a wild card resource, could lead to the scene you see here, astronauts looking at ice at the poles of the Earth's moon. And this was considered a pretty wild scenario by the majority of lunar researchers up until November of last year. The, the reason why there might be ice at the poles of the moon is that the moon's axis of rotation is only inclined about a degree and a half perpendicular to the ecliptic, compared to the Earth's 23 and a half degrees. So when, when we have winter in the northern hemisphere, the reason we have winter is not because we're far from the sun. In fact, we're closer to the sun in the winter than we are in the summer. The reason is the northern hemisphere is mainly pointed away from the sun. The moon, having only a degree and a half inclination, does not get polar summers. It's always cold in the poles. Now we know that the moon has been hit with lots of water-bearing material. In, in our lifetimes, the controversy about what made the craters on the moon was resolved. It was once thought that they might be volcanic. It's clear that they're impact craters. And looking at the impact cratering record has caused scientists to say, wow, that the stuff that hit the moon also hit the Earth, or much of the same stuff. The Earth got a terrific shellacking, but natural effects have obliterated most of the cratering. But now that we have good space photography, especially from shuttle, we're now finding the Earth is particularly well cratered. There are lots of crater formations, and some are really very large. In fact, there's a big search on now for the big crater from the asteroid that caused the KT boundary extinction, extinction of many species on the Earth. But what happened to all the volatiles? In fact, it's also now widely believed that a significant proportion of the Earth's water and volatiles came from space in the same manner you know, by, this, by this cosmic bombardment that we know because we know we've studied the moon. Where's the water? It's not at the pole. It's not at the equator of the moon. There have been six sites with people. The Soviets have brought back material from two sites, dry as a bone. In fact, lots drier than bone. But because of this cold effect, cold trap effect at the poles, it may very well be that the water that was at the equator has migrated and formed at the poles of the moon. Now, this was considered moderately avant-garde stuff. Some astronomers and space scientists have believed it ardently for 30 years. Others have disbelieved it ardently for 30 years. A majority disbelieved it. And those of us who said that it's possible, we've always said, it's a gambler's chance. Let's go look. But something neat happened in last November, and that is that astronomers bouncing radar off of Mercury discovered that Mercury seems to have an ice cap. Yeah, Mercury, hot place. But Mercury also had almost zero inclination. And the radar signals coming back from Mercury show the exact same properties or almost identical properties to the radar signals that come off of polar Mars, for example. And it's not just the, the reflectance, which is very high, but the polarization of the, of the signal. And it's caused a lot of my former skeptical friends to say, oh yeah, water and moon, almost certainly. <laughs> We still really don't know. But we ought to know, and here's why we ought to know. We ought to know because in the history of space exploration, there's a fork in the road. We're almost at the fork in the road. The fork is, the sign of the fork says moon is dry or moon is wet. And it's the biggest fork we can see. Why? Because water is rocket propellant. Water is the gasoline of space, hydrogen and oxygen. It's also, water is the basic chemical reagent for almost all processes that we use in the air. If we have water, life's easy. And we ought to know this. And we've been really perturbed by the fact that NASA 
for a lot of years has been saying, we're going to make this pathway decision. We're going to decide whether we're going to go to Pluto via Poughkeepsie or Phobos via Philadelphia. We're going to make this decision up right around now. That, that was the spiel that, that people were saying in NASA about five years ago. They say, early 90s, we're going to make the pathway decision. Well, pathway decision without knowing this is incredibly stupid. It's the wrong thing to do. We don't have the data. Let's just get the data. It's not tough to do. But NASA hasn't been successful. Why? For 30 years, NASA's tried to get a lunar polar orbiter. And for 30 years, they failed because they want a Cadillac orbiter. They want the lunar polar orbiter, or name it what you want, it's had about 12 names. Lots of our good friends at JPL and other places <coughs> have gone to the map time and time again. And time and time again, they get told, go away, too much money. But there's a fallacy in what they were doing. They were asking for the Cadillac of space probes. But you can get the answer to this question and a lot of the other questions that are uh, very important for lunar science. You don't need the Cadillac of space probes. You can do it with the moped of space probes, probably the unicycle of space probes. Now, some people have said it's really important. The National Commission on Space in 1986 said it's a first priority to search for these possible frozen models. And for about the last seven years, in particular, the Space Studies Institute has taken up the banner of being product champion for a simple lunar probe, which we've come to call Lunar Prospector. And we've talked to NASA administrators and uh, various and sundry people about this, and especially worked a lot with JPL on it. And we found a barrier, and the barrier was that, that the supposed Cadillac of space probe was the enemy of these simple, low-cost probes. That the planetary science community said, hey, if you do your simple one, Congress people who don't know any better will say, yeah, moon probe, the box is checked, we don't get our good one. So we're going to hold out for the really good one. In the meantime, the space operations people and the people interested in space exploration, they don't get the data they need to make a sensible pathway decision. So it's been a real a quandary, and we got so upset about it, and, and we finally said, okay, look, we're not getting anywhere with that. So we tried, we tried. We got Fletcher interested. He went out to JPL, got specially briefed on it, and he couldn't work it through his own bureaucracy. <clears throat> what do we do? We said, well, let's look at the idea of doing it as a possible private venture or a quasi-private venture. Let's see what it could cost. We talked to the Soviets, and we got a commitment for a launch from them. We talked with Admiral Truly, and we got a commitment for a surplus gamma ray spectrometer from the Apollo program. We looked at how you might design a probe that could fly as a piggyback. It's a secondary payload on something like Ariane or Atlas. Take care of itself from geostationary transfer ellipse. Have enough onboard fuel to fly itself to the moon, go into low lunar orbit, and do its thing. We put out a, an RFP for the design of this kind of a probe, a fairly radical notion. And we got a couple of very, uh, we got several superlative bids. And we selected the bid of a company called Omni Systems Incorporated, which is located here in Southern California. And in fact, we have the president of Omni Systems, Wayne Stevens, sitting with us tonight. And this is not Wayne's probe. I'm sorry that I don't have a good slide of it. This is a, an SSI picture of a um, JPL concept. We made some of these slides to help JPL try to sell this. Here's the surplus gamma ray spectrometer. And Wayne's team did a phase B design study, and we built a mock up which exists about 90 miles from here of this. And we may have some good news to report in that. Mike Griffin, the new head of exploration for NASA, is kind of a wild man who comes out of the SDIO, Spitman Strategic Defense Initiative Organization, has a history of doing projects quickly and cheaply and effectively. He has got some religion about this idea, and he has suggested, in fact, one of his first public statements is, we're going to, instead of spending money on paper studies, we're going to spend NASA Office of Exploration money on real missions. It's modest missions, because the budget's not big. And modest missions that make sense now to him are lunar missions. We agree. And so NASA now has a program called Lunar Resources Mapper. And we're hoping that Wayne's company will get to build the Lunar Resources Mapper. That's not clear. They may choose to procure it in a sort of a more stodgy, traditional manner. 
but the design is there. And NASA is saying it will do this in a couple of years. Now, we've kind of heard this story before for the last 30 years. So we're keeping our, our work ready in case it's necessary to do it ourselves or, or with the help of our friends. But uh, in fact, today I was talking to Astro about seeing if we could bump some Astro masses for these balloons. But uh, the, the good news is that may happen, and it may happen in as little as two years. And then we'll know the answer. And either way, we'll know a lot more about the moon. We'll learn a great deal. But if it's there, if there's ice in them bar hills, it'll be a really special thing. Well, even if there are no Earth's on Trojan asteroids or no lunar water, or at least not abundant lunar water, with what we already know about the asteroids and about the material on the moon, we could build not only solar power satellites, but something that's important with respect to solar power satellites. It's housing for space workers and their families of a permanent nature. We were talking about how the Soviets had people in space for 300 days, but it's horrible to spend a couple hundred days at Mir, something the size of a small office. Uh, and it's not necessary, because we, we know enough, and NASA has worked on this idea for over 20 years now, a lot of it with us under the direction of Dr. O'Neill, on the idea of large-scale human habitats in space. Places where people could live quite comfortably. And the reason it's possible to conceive of such things is because you're not bringing the raw materials for the construction from the Earth's surface. And this idea is called space habitats or space colonies. Here's a design for a medium scale, medium big scale, space habitat for 10,000 people who live in this spherical section that we'll look into in a minute. The whole business rotates along this axis. These stacks of donuts are crop growing areas. Mirrors then light around cosmic ray shielding, which is just lunar slag, residue of lunar soil processing. You dock at the ends, which are despun. And this is that same kind of habitat. It's a 500 meter diameter in this design. This is a 10,000 person habitat. Compared in size with the Empire State Building and some other objects of familiar size. It's big, although it's mostly empty except for atmosphere. But made virtually entirely from lunar material. Some of the studies have gone on not too far from here, a few hundred miles up the road at Ames Research Center in San Francisco. <coughs> Uh, this shows looking across the habitat, here's one of two sets of windows to bring the light in, in the lunar glass. This artist has painted a river along the equator of this habitat. You can picture having a nice float down the river and looking straight up and seeing somebody looking straight at you floating on the other side. The uh, NASA artist, Greg Gardice, painted in uh, some of the people from the actual Ames study. They had a little wine and cheese party and like, I suspect they're drinking Italian space colony or was that? <laughs> the, the little orange thing there is somebody pedaling a hang glider. If you were to pedal, uh, if you were to, to depart from the axis of rotation, you'd have effectively zero G in the center. These layers here are to have low G. Imagine a swimming pool at a tenth of a G where you could do a 50 turn somersault routine before hitting the water. Or imagine a place where where people who are prisoners of gravity now, quadriplegics, for example, could lead normal lives in a region like this, or hospitals where you could recover from burns or things, you know, in a 20th of a gene. Other people have suggested honeymoon hotels and other irreverent things. The crop growing areas sort of existence. If you looked at what you could do with simple materials, and it turns out that using Brooklyn Bridge technology, steel cable, concrete, you could build cylinders 20 miles long and 4 miles in diameter, housing a million people each. And that's, that's no unobtainium, just steel, rock. Now, I don't think that it will be efficient to build habitats on that scale. People may choose to do it when they don't care about the efficiency. But uh, it's not the most efficient use of the land area. But it's fun to think about what it might be like in such a, a large island three type colony. Imagine a world where our grandchildren wake up to a scene like this, three land areas, three window areas, 
where the world doesn't mean the planet, or this planet or that planet, because as you've seen, planets are kind of a crummy place. Except for the Earth, that has nice gravity that we're used to. You can't ever do anything about that on any of the other planets. Mars is always going to be cold, and gravity is always going to be wrong, and, and terraforming is a prodigious waste of effort compared to building habitats. It's like, it's like trying to build a, instead of building houses on the Earth, just trying to build an astronaut for the whole planet at a time. Not particularly effective. Good science fiction dream, but, but if you think about it for more than, than a few minutes, it's pretty ridiculous. And, and some very prescient people in the early 60s actually had a debate about terraforming and said, hey, absolutely goofy thing to do compared to this kind of thing. Because some folks have seen this. It's not an original idea. The world would mean any place where human beings have material and energy to work with. And just the known big asteroids, and we, we know we don't see most of the little ones, have enough raw material to build space habitats with land areas equivalent to thousands of Earths. So what does that really mean? That's an almost incomprehensible thing. What does it mean? It means that the limits to growth thinking is wrong. It's not dubious. It's not suspect. It's wrong, flat wrong. It is not a limit because there's energy and material to work with in huge abundance. We're not accustomed to working with it. And why is that? Because of the way we think of space. When you and I say space, the image in our mind, at least most of our minds, is a void, a vacuum, a desert. Space has those attributes, but really, if you think about it harder, space is an ocean. It's rich in energy and material. And we've begun to understand that. It takes us a while to adapt to new things. Those footsteps made 20 years ago began to unlock the concept of space as an ocean. It's a place of abundance. And the timing was good, because it's also when we started to realize that the Earth itself is in jeopardy. This very special place that seems unique. It's unique in, in human knowledge as the oasis, as an oasis that can support life. We, our very existence on this planet jeopardizes future life on this planet. There's nothing wrong about that. Some people would have you believe that that it's somehow there's something wrong with being human and, and altering in some ways the earth. We alter it just by being here, and that's that's the rules of the game. It's not wrong for us to exist. It's our duty to exist. It's also our duty to be smart and not to mess up our nest. And to do, and I think, in a way, it's, it's, our, it's always been a sort of imperative, a human imperative, to expand our ecological niche. Human beings are unique in that they don't inhabit just one part of the Earth. They inhabit the entire Earth, and they can do that because of technology. But the Earth is not the only container now. We know that make our own. The solar system can be our ecological niche and beyond eventually. In the past, when human beings changed their mental scale of things by physical exploration, something else happened. When Europeans figured out that Europe was not all there was, they were not the center of everything, and they did their classic exploration voyages that started in the 1500s, 1600s. Ooh. Something triggered, something was triggered. The Renaissance. Earthquake. Earthquake. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. you. You don't understand how rare these things are in the East. <laughs> My special thanks to the committee for providing <laughs> When, when, people, when people discovered that they were not at the center of things, not only did their physical perceptions change, but their perceptions of a lot of things changed. Their, their ideas of theater and art changed. Their self-identity changed. In the West, we call that European blossoming of thought the Renaissance. Recent scholars have looked and they've seen the same thing happen in China, in Greece, in Holland, Various places where physical frontiers were dissolved. Big outreach took place. We are looking at the grandest renaissance of all time. 
unprecedented in human history. And we can make it happen. We can, in doing so, ensure the survival of our species. So, uh, I commend to you the work done by our colleagues at the Space Studies Institute. There are a number of, of people who have been colleagues of the Institute for many years. Randy Giganti from OASIS, NSS chapter uh, in the Los Angeles area, has brought with him some information about SSI and also copies of Dr. O'Neill's book, The High Frontier, which is an excellent book, and I encourage you to get a copy from Randy if you haven't had a chance to read it. Take a look at it and join us in, in this work, in our quest for uh, a new concept of home for humanity. With that, I'd like to stop and show you a piece of hardware. I've showed you a lot of pretty pictures and some hardware. I've got another short tape. I'd like to show you another historical tape of the first mass driver, which uh, was demonstrated publicly for the first time in 1977 at one of our biennial Princeton conferences on space manufacturing, which are, by the way, published by the AIAA. The capacitor is dumped into the coil through a silicon-controlled rectifier, transistor on-off switch. The remaining length of the machine is simply some tubing that constrains the bucket and squeezes it and slows it down so it doesn't make a crater in the wall. <laughs> which is considered bad manners in Princeton. This is Professor Henry Cohn at MIT. And uh, here the bucket is being bathed in liquid nitrogen to lower its resistance. I can assure you that being bathed in liquid nitrogen would lower your resistance as well. Really. Uh, the scene, I think, has now shifted to Princeton University. Yes, it has. And behind Henry's head is the head of Woodrow Wilson. This is at the Woodrow Wilson School of International Affairs at Princeton. Here is our high-technology bucket stopper, a plywood box with styrofoam in front and lead brick in it. Now, uh, as I say, this was shot at one of our conferences in 77. Kevin Fine from MIT got his master's degree for his participation in the, this Mass Driver 1 project. And in a few moments, you'll see them test fire it. Uh, the reason I'm showing you Mass Driver 1, and it's going to move very quickly, I'll, I'll give you a clue so you don't miss it, is that you can't see Mass Driver 2 and 3 in operation because the, the projectile leaves the machine and hits the target, and it seems to be simultaneous. So it's not fun to look at. Now here the bucket is taken out of the liquid nitrogen, and you can see the moisture streaming off it. It's very humid in Princeton in May. And they don't know it yet, but the moisture is going to give them a problem because this bucket coil here gets its power by physical contact with two of the copper tubes which, which held that bucket. And it gets it just by carbon brushes, and the brushes have ice built up on them. So here the Nova cameraman pans dramatically down the track, and nothing's going to happen, but you can see what the general setup is going to be. And the team quickly figures out that ice built up on the brushes, so they're going to wiggle the bucket back and forth for a moment, scrape the ice off, and then they're going to count down, and I'll give you a countdown. When I get down to round zero, don't blink or you're going to miss this. And the bucket's lined up. Five, four, three, two, one. Wow. See that? Wow. Let's try it again. Let's see if we can make it reserve. In a fraction of a second. That's only 33 G. That's 33 G. Now remember, this is our clunka junk mass driver number one. Two, one. Pop. So this stuff is real, gang. Real machines, and real research funded by folks like you and I and, and some corporate sponsors who are not content to have these things dependent only on the little bit of advanced project funding that still remains after funding the big macro NASA projects. So I invite you to join with us.
And, and now uh, let me make myself available for questions for a couple moments. And, and before that, thank you very much for your kind attention. Excuse me, second. substrate, the moon, uh, I don't think that it's nearly as efficient. And it's a really complicated system. You have the beam power from the moon, and you have reflectors in Earth orbit. And I think just building reflectors in Earth orbit is about 90% of the problem with building the SPSs in Earth orbit. So I'm pretty skeptical about it. I think it might be a terrific system for the 22nd century, but I don't think it's, uh, it makes much sense. It's a lot of processing, a lot of it's a really really big macro project. And I don't think it need be so big. I'm not against it, but I, I don't think it's the next step. Sir. Yeah, in the late 1960s, the Soviets sent probes uh, in, uh, to the moon in lunar orbit to carry gamma rays to come in polar orbit. Have you reviewed the data to see what they uh, I don't think that that's specifically true. They sent landers, they sent some things in high orbit, but I don't think they sent anything in low lunar orbit. In fact, NASA sent some things into low lunar orbit when they sent the Apollo command modules. Uh, they had gamma ray spectrometers, but if you look at the pattern of coverage, it's a tiny percentage of the lunar surface, less than 20 percent. Uh, there is not gamma ray spectrometer data from the Soviets that, that, that tells us about the lunar composition. We talked to the Soviets about what they've got. They, don't, they haven't got it. But we do have we have pictures of the moon from lunar a lunar polar orbiter, uh, the U.S. flew in preparation for landing from the moon, but they were fairly crude pictures, and they suffered from the same. The problem is the poles are dark because they don't get illuminated, which is the reason they went that water. So there is not there is not uh, <coughs> spectrographic data that's able to tell us about this. There's some there's some hope that they might get some glints of off ice from from Galileo. For Approach to the they look for it the last time. It's not a it's not a trivial thing. For example, the source of the gamma rays that activate the gamma ray spectrometer is cosmic radiation. So you have to spend a lot of time, and you have to get pretty close. You have to be in a low orbit, and that's not what has happened so far. So that's what needs to happen, sir. Is there any chance that it, uh, solar power, uh, terrestrial-based solar power, is Cheap enough that the this, this solar power is based in space will make it. And that's a lot of the even with politicians I talk to locally. They talk about power, solar power. That they, they're interested in that, but space-based solar power, they seem to be let their eyes glaze over on that. Yeah, it, it's tough. If you do the sums, it, the biggest problem with terrestrial solar power is it's not there a lot of the time when you need it, and you have to invoke storage mechanisms that don't exist. There is no good way to store electricity. Power. The only way that people store utility scale energy mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. in the world today is by pumping water up down into the reservoirs and having it run back down when you need peaking power. Terrestrial photovoltaics are good for peak power, for peak power, because they get sunlit at the time when people need peak power in the middle of the day. So they're great for peak power, but they're not good for base load power. They're not reliable enough unless you have storage. So it's the storage part of the equation that hurts you. But there's no reason not to do terrestrial photovoltaics, and they're not enemies of each other. In fact, I think you should do both. In fact, you can put photovoltaics under the rectennas because, as you can see, they're pretty wispy things. You can see right through a rectenna. You can grow plants under a rectenna. I think you should probably do both. The Germans are looking at using laser transmission of power from space and having photovoltaics that are efficient both at the laser frequency and at regular sunlight, multi-layer cells, so they use the photovoltaics. They get artificial light, basically. It's like having bright sunshine all the time. 
on the top of that, they'll get regular sunshine whenever it's really around. So they're not enemies of each other. And in particular, all these things work nicely with things like hydrogen economy. If you have solar power satellites <coughs> which produce 24 hour power, people don't really need power all the time. They don't need it at midnight, or they don't need as much. So you can use that off peak power to make hydrogen fuel for vehicles, for, for export, for storage. It's not all that great for storage, but it's, it's a little bit in that direction. So I think that they're very compatible, but not, they're not enemies of each other, they're cooperators. What happened to JPL's getaway special lunar uh, polar orbit? JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, had a neat idea. They said, look, if the problem, is, the problem is that we're thinking too big for getting a lunar polar probe of some kind. How about if we go really small and really cheap to launch? And they said, let's take one of these getaway specials, which is a NASA program to fly a garbage can-sized payload on the space shuttle for about $10,000. Now they've raised the money on it, but cheap. And a team at JPL designed a little ion engine propelled vehicle, which would extend very long solar arrays and slowly wind its way out very low thrust, low, big gravity loss problem. With ion engines, you don't care too much. And over about a year and a half, get to low lunar orbit. A couple big problems with that. We were very interested in that. We, had, we helped them promote that quite a lot. The, the problems are essentially, it's very tough to package a big solar cell array into a getaway special. It's really, really tough. And a lot of satellite failures have nothing to do with the electronics failing, but the just mechanical deployments failing. It's a high risk proposition. The other thing was they were way too optimistic about the power conditioning requirements for, for the thing. So you couldn't fit it in the getaway special. But, but so what? So fit it into the body of the shuttle, who cares? It's still a really good idea. Freeman Dyson is one of our directors from the Institute for Advanced Study. Has talked about small autonomous space probes. Some of you may have read his book, Infinite in All Directions. Uh, and he called this idea an astro chicken. And the idea is instead of these big, complicated probes, you fly a lot of little simple probes, which are pretty autonomous, pretty smart, especially if you have a cluster of them, they can do some pretty remarkable things. And I think that that kind of astro, that kind of spacecraft will happen. I think we're not really at the astro chicken level, we're more in sort of the additive. Wayne Stevens' little prospect is more like astro condor. It's bigger. But it's, it's a good start. And the, part of the good news is that there are people now. This new guy, Golden, the National Space Council, the SDIO people, who say, hey, small isn't. You know, you can start small. You take small steps. We joke that SSI is going to be a small steps institute. <laughs> a small step is better than sticking in there thinking about what you're going to do when NASA's budget doubles and someday, maybe. Or the tooth fairy comes or whatever. Yeah. So there are people who have internalized this. Um, and I think we will see stuff like El Gas that are getaway special, but it won't, it won't quite be. Still need out there. One last question. Well, I have two, but I think one of them can be Okay, answered. then I'll take that question. Pretty quickly. Please, uh, <laughs> because I know one. Go ahead. So. Uh, okay, if gallium arsenide is better than silicon for solar cells, uh, there's a lot of silicon on the moon. Is gallium arsenide a small enough portion of the material needed to build a solar power satellite that you can ship it up from Earth and it doesn't add that much to the cost? Or? Well, I think that when we've kind of gotten to a level of thinking about it that says for beginning it's a good thing to do, but like I said, you're making a lot of these, you make them out of probably out of silicon. Okay. So it, it might be a good interim step. Okay. My, my second question kind of follows on to what you're talking about. Assume that NASA funding stays flat. Um, you talked about a lot of different technologies and visionary ideas that fit together. What would drive the development of this in infrastructure? Where, where's the money going to come from if the government doesn't do it? I mean, you know, you talk about small steps, but do you see the environmental thing driving this, or what, what's going to make it happen? Well, I think that, that a lot of these ideas can be worked on for a fraction of the cost of the existing space program. Activity. There's a lot of stuff that, and this may be heretical, but I will say it because it's what I believe, that we sort of don't need, we absolutely don't need Mars missions. They're human Mars missions right now. It'd be nice to have them. You don't need them. They bring very little value. You can climb out of our deep gravity well to go down into somebody else's deep gravity well. Spend about a year going there and coming back. 
half of the astronauts will develop a lethal cancer within five years of coming back if they do it the way that people are thinking about it now. I didn't make that up. That's something the doctors tell me. Um, it's useless. It's Apollo writ large. We don't need it. So because we don't need it, people are, you know, another thing we don't need is we, we don't need to think about doing these things as in the manner that space projects have been done before. There is a myth, which is that space has to be expensive. But there are reasonable people who have thought about it deeply for a long period of time who, who have come to the conclusion that the reason space projects <coughs> cost so much to develop is because. That's not a satisfactory answer, but that's the answer. And, and, and here's, the, here's the existence proof for that. They say the Cadillac. Well, it's not just the Cadillac thing. It's the, it's the myth, and the myth is very strong, and it's especially strong in young space engineers fresh out of graduate school, young AIAA guys and gals who want to be good little AIAA guys and gals. And they've internalized the dogma. And this is also heretical, but I believe it to be true. Uh, example, uh, a friend of Buzz Aldrin's uh, named, uh, I had to put his name in the moment, but wrote an excellent article called The Issue is Cost, and you look at this, in detail, and he said, look, I just came back from a conference, he says, where they were looking at what it might cost to design and build a one-person sort of space pod like that asteroid space pod I was showing you, one astronaut, hard box kind of environment, not a spacesuit, more than a spacesuit. And the number that came out was $190 million. Keep somebody threw that number out. Nobody flinched. <laughs> Funny thing is, I also, before I went to the NASA conference, I was talking to my friends who were building Deep Rover. It's a one-person undersea vehicle that works in a much tougher environment than space. Lots of current, gets shoved around a lot. Big thermal sinks, big problem keep people warm in it. Uh, you go through consumables at about the same rate as space. But the cost of developing Deep Rover was like $800,000. <laughs> well, the traditional school book answer about why the space system costs 100 times more is because of liability. Well, guess what? The people who designed and built Deep Rover are the people who drive Deep Rover around. And they are real concerned about reliability. <laughs> they kind. They have what you might call a vested interest. <laughs> so I have come to believe, at first I wasn't so skeptical about that argument. But in looking at it, I think it's true. It's uh, an argument that, that feeds on itself. People say, well, it's got to be reliable because space launch costs are high, and therefore um, you've got to make things reliable because you're paying so much money that if you miss the boat, you know, just you're sunk. You can't afford to try again. One of the reasons launch costs are high is because, especially in the West, is because people are very worried about reliability as well, and they're worried about breaking this very expensive device that was built to be so reliable and cost so much money. Soviets have a very different philosophy. I've been working with the Soviets now for the past three years or so. They stamp out their rockets, and they're pretty reliable. They're reliable because they've built a lot of the same kind of systems. They're up the learning curve. They're way up the learning curve. And they are much less finicky about reliability than we are in, in a lot of ways that make sense. They're certainly, I mean, you can certainly point to Soviet failures in their Mars probes and such and say, well, reliability sure would help. But for a lot of things, I think we're, we're beating a dead horse. We're trying to, a lot of it is we're trying to do, we're trying to over-engineer things. We're trying to build, you got to remember what it is we're trying to do. If what we're trying to do is to build, get lots of things up into space, that's a different proposition than trying to use an engine with the highest ISP. A NASA friend of mine from Ames said, after thinking about it a lot, and after several beers, said, I, one of the things I think is wrong with the space program is that there's really people with real different ideas about what you should do and they're, they're in conflict with each other. It's kind of like a big family. Half the people in the family want to get across town on the bus and the other half of the family is interested in designing better buses. So when the people who want to get across town find, go and find the bus in pieces because they're tinkering with the bus, they're not happy. And when the folks, other folks are driving around on the bus, the tinkerers can't tinker. 
And I think that there's a lot of stuff we could improve. But the real, why aren't we improving? Why isn't it changing? Or why does it not seem to be changing? One reason is because people were generally kind of happy with the space program. And I think it was so, pretty much the case up until about challenging. Um, impressed with this idea of um, space colonization and all. But the one thing that really bothers me is um, for solar power satellites, it seems to me that it's kind of inherently unbalanced to have all these um, solar power satellites beaming energy down to the Earth. That energy has to eventually go somewhere. And aren't we going to run into a overheating problem or something? The answer to that question is a great question. The answer to the question is that, yes, the energy is going to go someplace. But if you don't get it from solar power satellites, where are you getting it? Typically, you're getting it by burning coal or making atoms fizz, fission. And those processes, the SPS, as you saw, the, the, the Recten is about 90% efficient in taking that radio energy and converting it into electrical energy. So only 10% is waste heat. You have the inverse in a coal-fired plant or a nuclear plant. 90% of the, of the heat that you make to get 10% of the electricity goes into the biosphere. So you run up against those problems lots, lots sooner with these other systems. And there is an absolute heat limit someplace. Nobody knows where it is. People are starting to think about it. But you hit that heat limit much sooner with conventional power generation. And even with terrestrial solar cells, that's Randy asked that question. You put a lot of solar cells on the Earth, you change the Earth's albedo. You change its reflectivity. It'll, you heat up the Earth. So the answer is, as far as I know, and I'm willing to be corrected, but I've looked into it a lot, and a lot of people have looked into it a lot, the least heat-producing source of power that has been thought of today is space solar power. So on that cheery note, thank you once again. <laughs>